Ah, okay. Now it's perfect. Uh, sorry for that. I didn't realize I couldn't see the waiting room anymore. So I was just uh, just waiting for the participants. Uh, great. So let's not wait any further since we are already past 7 p.m. Uh, in Turkey uh, and uh, 8 a.m. Uh, in L.A. Am I right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, so welcome, everyone. Good morning or, or good evening, depending on wherever you're, uh, you are. And thanks for, for joining us for, uh, for today's lecture. Um, let me take a few minutes to, to introduce our uh, speaker. Uh, Paola Giuliano is a professor of economics at the UCLA um, Anderson School of Management. Uh, she's also affiliated with uh, MBER, CEPR, and the, the IZA. Um, her um, main areas of research include culture and economics um, and political economy. And she also has a lot of influential papers on, uh, on gender. Uh, she has published many many uh, influential uh, papers uh, that are of inspiration uh, to researchers, including me. So we are very, very happy to have her with us today. Um, let me briefly remind of the format of the, the lectures, and then we're going to uh, to, to listen to, to Paola. Uh, so this will be a one hour uh, talk. I'm going to be muting your uh, microphones during the talk. But uh, if you have clarification questions, please type them on the chat screen so that I can convey them to, to Paola. Uh, but after uh, Paola's lecture, we'll have a 15 minute uh, Q&A session uh, where we can uh, discuss um, where we can uh, we can discuss further. Uh, so now I'll leave the stage to Paola for uh, her lecture on uh, how immigrants shape uh, preferences for redistribution in the short and long term. Uh, thank you again very much, Paola, for joining us today. Um, thank you very much for the very nice introductions. Let me uh, share my screen. Can you see my slides? Perfect. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure uh, to be here, even if it's uh, just uh, virtual. So let me give you a broad overview of the topic that I'm going to uh, cover today. So I will review a few uh, representative paper. Part of it will be obviously based on my research on what is the effect of immigrants on uh, preferences for redistribution. And so this is a very important topic, um, not only for the US, but for many, many countries, because um, many uh, receiving countries are receiving a large number of people. And then immigrants come, of course, with different economic characteristics, but they also come with different uh, culture, different race, different ethnicities, and also different religion and social norms. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to review several papers that look at the effect of immigrants on uh, preferences for redistributions. So preferences for redistributions are preferences that indicate whether people are willing typically to redistribute from uh, the rich to the poor. And, uh, and I will try to uh, understand whether the short term effect can be different from the long term effect. So what's our, uh, the potential channel? So most of the literature uh, studied uh, the short-term effect of immigrations on preferences for redistributions. And uh, you know, one uh, typical effect is that there should be a backlash. So this is an outgroup. And so usually the literature on preferences for redistribution posits that when there are people different than us in a variety of dimensions, then we don't like to redistribute towards them. Uh, and so I written a paper several years ago, a review paper with um, Alberto Lesina and the literature on preferences for redistribution indicates that an increased diversity usually reduce preferences for redistribution. What people haven't done much, and this is part one of the paper that they've written is does, does this effect in the short term can be different in the long term? And we find that it can be, at least for the US, very different. And one potential intuition is the contact hypothesis. And so this means that depending on the characteristic of the immigrants and also on the type of intergroup contacts that natives have with immigrants, then immigrants can uh, essentially increase preferences for redistributions and even make um, people in the receiving countries more liberal. 
Uh, and as a result of assimilations, one can also argue that whatever negative stereotype you tend to um, uh, see in the short term, it fades away in the long term. So let me review uh, some of the paper first broadly, and then I will uh, zoom in in each of them. So I will first start with the evidence uh, from Europe. So this is a paper that has been recently published uh, by um, Alezina and co-authors. And uh, what they do, I will show you the representative table, but they have a very rich data set uh, at the regional level. So they have 16 European countries that are observed between 1990 and 2010, 140 regions. And they did find what the literature and preferences for redistributions would anticipate, meaning that uh, the presence of immigrants is correlated with uh, lower preferences for redistribution. And there is a very interesting uh, heterogeneous, there are very interesting heterogeneous effect, meaning that this uh, negative effect on preferences for redistributions is stronger in countries with a more generous welfare state. Uh, it's also stronger for voters that are at the center right of the political spectrum, and then it's also stronger among natives with more negative views about uh, immigrants. And then the more dissimilar immigrants are, the stronger is the effect. So what the author finds is that the results are stronger when foreign-born individuals come from the Middle East and uh, Northern Africa, and when there is not much intergroup contact, so when immigrants are residentially segregated. And so a recent paper on Austria uh, find a similar effect. So the first paper just review preferences for redistribution, nothing on political outcomes. So the paper on Austria finds that immigration raised support for the uh, uh, Freedom Party of Austria, and the result is mostly driven by unskilled migrants. So for the case of the US, you find the result in a similar vein, mostly for the political attitude. So this is, it was just published in the, uh, one of the AJ journal. So it's a paper by Maida and co-authors and they did find that the skill of immigrants is very important in determining support for different political parties. So if immigrants are unskilled, they increase the support for the Republican Party, but then skilled immigrants have the opposite effect, increasing the vote for the Democratic Party. If you go back in time, uh, so historically, so this is a very interesting paper by uh, Marcel Alsan and co-author. They look at Irish immigrants in different Massachusetts cities during the early 1850, and they did find that the, there is an increased support for the no nothing party. Um, so uh, 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 I, I will review a paper that I've written with Marco Tabellini, but Marco Tabellini has written a paper on the historical presence of immigrants on uh, preferences for redistribution during the age of mass migrations. And uh, again, consistent with the literature on preferences for redistribution, Marco finds that uh, cities that receive more immigrants were more likely to cut pub public spending and uh, tax rates. And again, interesting heterogeneous effect, the effect was driven by immigrants from non-Protestant uh, countries, whether the old immigrants group didn't have any effect. Uh, so are the results different from the short term to the long term? And so what the literature basically find for the short term is that the effect of immigrants depends on the attributes of the immigrants. So it could be different religions, different level of skills. It depends in, for, uh, on the type of intergroup interaction. So if you look at the paper by Elezin and co-author. Uh, so one of the papers for which I'm going to give you uh, more detail is a paper that I've written with uh, Marco Tabellini. And uh, our story is the following. So when immigrants arrive in a given country, they bring with them um, different preferences for redistributions. So in our case, we will look at the age of mass migrations. And so the immigrants, when they arrived to the US, they were already exposed to the welfare system in Europe. And so our story is that uh, they, uh, especially if the size of the immigrants is very large, they may transmit their preferences for redistributions to people from the US. 
And consistently with this story, what we find is that whenever there are more, whenever there is more intergroup, then the results are stronger. So if whenever we observe um, more intermarriage, more residential integrations, and more linguistic similarity, this spillover effect from the immigrants' culture to the ideology of people for the US appears to be stronger. Uh, and so uh, our story is that maybe initially you have a backlash, but if immigrants bring with them different preferences, then uh, the effect can be even stronger in the long run because the intergroup would be more prevalent. Uh, so let me review uh, some of the paper for the short term more in details, and then I will talk mostly about uh, my papers. So this is a very interesting paper by Elezina Miano and uh, Stancheva. And so they, they study the classical questions, which is the link between immigrations and redistributions. But what they study is the perception of immigrations. And then one interesting aspect is that the perceptions can be very different than uh, reality, okay? And then further, you know, they conduct their own survey. They want to see if perceptions of immigrants can be causal in explaining preferences for redistribution. <clears throat> Let me tell you, what they do, they collect their own data. So these are very large data set for a variety of countries. So the countries that they study are the US, the UK, uh, Sweden, Italy, Germany, and France. And so first of all, they do study the perceptions. And what they did find that independently of the different countries, people overestimate uh, and often by a large amount, the number of immigrants. And these misperceptions tend to be stronger in high immigration sectors where the level of education is low, among people without college, who are young, with an immigrant's parents, and also among women. Uh, the second thing that they uh, discover is that people think that immigrants are culturally and religiously more distant from them, uh, okay? So these are, again, for all the different countries, how people perceive the share of Muslim immigrants and, so, uh, and how they perceive the share of Christian immigrants, which is more similar to them. And then they find that there is a huge misperception, especially when the immigrants are culturally different. And they also think that compared to reality, immigrants are economically weaker. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, people tend to believe that immigrants are less educated, more unemployed, and they also rely much more on government transfer. So uh, what they then do, they see if this stereotype uh, just essentially reduce preferences for redistributions, and they find very interesting result, meaning that as long as you are reminded, uh, as long as there is a salience questions on the presence of immigrants, preferences for redistributions are lower. They find that information matters. So for example, if you correct the initial perceptions, then people reduce a, a little bit, you know, they, they become more favorable to redistributions, but not completely. Okay, and so this is what these, uh, uh, table shows so the salience questions typically has an is considered like a negative stereotype if you control for the share of immigrants the origin of immigrants essentially doesn't do much the only thing that matters a bit is uh, whether so they have um, like a vignette in which they show that immigrants can work really hard and so having a treatment when you remind people that immigrants are hardworking, increase preferences for redistributions, but it doesn't affect uh, much the overall effect. Uh, and uh, again, this is the, the importance of hard work. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's salient when you don't have the negative stereotype, but uh, overall it doesn't matter much. And so was again the conclusions from uh, this literature again this is true for the US but also also for European countries is the perceptions of immigrants tend to be systematically wrong <clears throat> and negative and just making people think about immigrants brings out baseline negative views and this has a negative effect on preferences for redistribution so this is uh, <clears throat> the result on on Europe so again, the paper by uh, Alezina and co-authors. So you have two maps. One indicates the share of immigrants 
in different regions so they can control for country fixed effects so you know all the variations comes at the regional level so Italy is the country where uh, I come from and you can see there is in Italy there is a bit of south north divide but there is sufficient variations overall and what you find already what you can notice already visually is that the share of immigrants is uh, correlated with uh, preferences for redistribution and so this is what uh, the author do. They have, uh, they use the uh, European Social Survey uh, and they have a, a variety of questions. So the largest is a standard question that has been used in literature, which is whether the government should reduce income differences. So as you can see, they have 134,000 observations. They control for um, a country year fixed effect. They have regional controls. They have individual controls, um, income controls, and the ideology controls, and the result is very stable. So if you take European countries, the presence of immigrants is associated with lower preferences for redistribution. Then there are, in the same survey, there are more specific survey on welfare attitudes. So they take a principal component, they construct an index. The drawback, so it's more precise, so it's all across different uh, questions, but the sample size is smaller, but again, the results are very similar and they indicate uh, that the presence of immigrants is negatively associated with preferences for the distribution. Uh, and so when they, they have very interesting heterogeneous effect, so independently of the measure of preferences for redistributions that they use, they find that if countries have a higher welfare states, then there is a larger reduction. So the idea is that when immigrants rely more on the welfare states than natives, and so this is one of the stereotypes that also uh, Alessina and Sanchevan Miano uncover uh, in their paper. Uh, and they also find that there is a heterogeneous effect depending on the country of origin. More specifically for the case of Europe, the effect is stronger if immigrants comes uh, mostly from the Middle East. Uh, skills uh, matters, and so the less skills immigrants have, the, ne the most negative is um, this effect. Uh, uh, and so, and again, this is uh, uh, skills in terms of education, but they also do level of skills in terms of um, occupations. Uh, so uh, one thing, because it's going to be important for um, the paper that, that I also wrote, is that um, how much uh, segregation there is matters. And so in their case, if immigrants are very segregated, then uh, preferences for redistribution set to be lower. And so this could be rationalized with the contact hypothesis. So you have a negative stereotype. You don't interact with these new people that come to your countries, and so you don't want to redistribute towards them. And so this is the summary of the result for the European countries. So larger share of immigrants reduces preferences for redistribution. Again, the results are stronger when the, uh, there is a more uh, generous welfare state. I didn't show you uh, the table, but they also find that there is an heterogeneous effect depending on the characteristic of people in the receiving countries. So if the result is stronger, not surprising for voters at the center right of the political spectrums and then among natives with the more, more negative views about immigrants. And again, uh, if foreign born are uh, um, culturally uh, distant uh, and more uh, segregated then preferences for redistribution tend to be even lower. Uh, this is what uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, uh, in the remaining part of my lecture, I'm going to talk about <clears throat> a paper that I wrote with uh, Marco Tabellini. And what we do is we look at the long term effect of immigration on American ideology. So we study <clears throat> one specific uh, point of, in American history, which is uh, the age of mass migrations. And then I will speculate about uh, the external validity if, you know, in case I can say uh, something about that. But what we do is, is the, the arrival of immigrants during the age of mass uh, migration still had an effect today on the political ideology and preferences for redistributions of um, people from the US. So let's me give a bit of background for this historical period. So in this chart, um, I, uh, this chart represents the fraction of immigrants um, as a percentage of the US populations from 1850 up to today. 
So the period that we uncover is the age of mass migrations, which roughly speaking goes from 1850 to 1930. And as you can see, the fraction of immigrants in terms of the percentage of the populations was extremely high. Uh, so this is if you zoom in, just to look at the variations, uh, because we use um, two shocks for our instrumental variable strategy. So again, it started fairly low and then it reached the peak uh, around 1900 and 1910. And then there were, there were two shocks. Uh, one is World War One, and was the introductions of the POTAS. This is if you want to have a sense, and this is, would be important for our story of uh, the country of origin. So there were essentially two waves. So initially, most of the immigrants came from North and Western Europe. And then uh, after 1900, there were a large fraction of immigrants coming from uh, uh, Southern and Eastern Europe. Then Canada and Australia and other countries were very minimal. So in all our regression, we just control for the fractions of European immigrations. So um, what is um, uh, the economic intuitions? So one story would be essentially consistent with what the literature on preferences for redistributions um, posit, which is immigrations uh, may have reduced uh, preferences for uh, redistributions. And this could be for a variety of reasons. One is increased diversity. So there are all these people, they come with different religions, different language, not much different race uh, for this specific period of time. And so, and we know from the literature on preferences for redistributions, and when there are people different than us, we don't want to redistribute. There could be also a direct economic effect, but I will explain that this uh, will bias our result, the result against us. And again, uh, this is consistent with the story, um, and there is a very interesting book by Alizine and Glaser that uh, more diverse societies in average tend to have lower preferences for redistribution. There is a very interesting book uh, by Lipset and Marx, so the title is It Didn't Happen Here, and they want to explain why socialism was never prevalent in the US. And their story is that um, workers in the, it was hard for workers in the US to, to form a working class um, identity because they were coming from too many different countries. So if you take a working class, they were identified much more as being Germans or Irish or Italians rather than form a unique identity. And this uh, implied that socialism was never a prevalent ideology in the US. And then if you look at the direct effect uh, if I look at Meltzer and Richard, uh, preferences for redistributions are negatively related uh, to income. So uh, there, are, there is a literature on preferences for redistributions for the US, meaning that when immigrants arrive, these counties become uh, richer. And then richer counties, higher level of income is typically related to lower preferences for redistributions, according to the seminal model by Meltzer and Richard. Um, the other story could be, of course, um, immigrant uh, selections. Uh, so what we know from the literature uh, is that more individualistic people are more likely to migrate and typically more individualism is related to lower preferences for redistribution. So again, the selections will go against us. And uh, there are a variety of papers for, from um, uh, Abramisky and Bustan and co-authors they do find that for the case of European countries during these periods, more successful immigrants are more likely to stay. And again, this will bias the result against us because if you're very successful, uh, and so if there is a lot of social mobility or perceived social mobility, if I am the poor of today and I know that I can become the rich of tomorrow, I don't want to redistribute. So all the result would bias the result against us. And so in fact, when we start working on the paper, we were thinking about the paper as a sort of a test of the Lipset and Marx. And then we found that the correlations were completely the other way around and we couldn't kill the result. And so we will try to uh, come up with an alternative story. Uh, okay. Uh, again, another element that biased the result is the American dream. But again, to the extent that the uh, immigrants work really, really hard, uh, typically, if you believe in the importance of effort, this should reduce preferences for redistribution. Uh, so what we think is an alternative story could be based on the contact hypothesis. 
So there are these immigrants, they arrive, they gradually assimilate in the new countries. And once they assimilate, especially if the size is very large, uh, so we haven't done much in terms of heterogeneity based on size, but we plan to do more. Uh, they can transmit the cultural ideologies to uh, the receiving countries. And this is what we indeed find. So we find that if you take American born respondents today that lives in counties in counties in the US that were more exposed to European immigrations, uh, they are more likely to be uh, to hold a liberal ideology. They're also more likely to vote for uh, Democrats and they have uh, stronger preferences for redistribution. So our story is the following. So immigrants brought with them their preferences for the welfare states. Uh, and so, and then they transmit these preferences uh, for the welfare states uh, to people from the US, okay? And so consistent with these uh, contact or interactions or horizontal transmissions, we find that the results are stronger when there is more linguistic similarity, when there is more intermarriage, when there is more residential integrations. And we also find, um, uh, we have new result in which we find stronger result when immigrants participate are more politically, when they are naturalized. Uh, and uh, you know, most of the results that I'm going to show you look at ideology today, uh, and then we relate ideology today with the presence of immigrants uh, in the past. Uh, but we will try to look at uh, you know, from the past to the present. And essentially one story is that the presence of immigrants became very, very important in the elections of 1928. And this is when there was an immigrant candidate that was able to mobilize, especially the second generation immigrants. So let me give you a broad overview of the data that we use in our project. So we use the full count US census of populations from 1900 to 1930. And we use the census to calculate the share of immigrants but also all the demographic and economic county level data and all the immigrants uh, characteristics. And then for the ideology today, we use a very um, interesting and rich data set. This is the Cooperative Congressional Election Studies. Uh, he has several advantages. So it's much larger in size uh, compared to the general social survey. He has uh, county identifiers. And it contains information on political ideology and uh, preferences for the distribution. So let me give you a broad uh, map of where the variations is coming from. So this map represents the fraction of immigrants. So I plotted from 1910 to 1930 because this is the period for which we use our instrument. And I use, you, you can see there is a lot of uh, variations. There were many immigrants in the East and the West Coast and the northern part of the US, much fewer in the south. And so all our results are robust to completely excluding the south to be sure that we are not capturing, uh, you know, south, non-south divide. All our regressions will include state fixed effect. So this is essentially the variations that we are going to use. Uh, this is the empirical strategy. So uh, the regressions are at the individual level. So we have, uh, preferences for redistribution and ideology for a given individual born in the US who lives in a given county C which belongs to a state S and a survey year T. So we always include a state fixed effect, a survey fixed effect, and then we have a large set of individual controls. I will tell you which they are. We have a large set of historical county controls. And then our coefficient of interest is the share of immigrants between 1910 and 1930. And I will tell you how we do the robustness by including the overall period. So in terms of historical controls, there are many robustness um, in the paper. So there is a long appendix, uh, but these are the uh, baseline controls, black and the urban share. So this is important for left-leaning ideology, uh, labor force uh, participations, employment share in manufacturing, and this is important for a uh, uh, left-leaning vote. The occupational income score, this is important for preferences for redistributions, and then in general, railroad and geographical coordinates. For the individual controls, you may have to approach 
Some people like to see just the exogenous one. So again, you can run regression just with a quadratic in a age, gender, and uh, race. So race is especially being black. It's a important predictor for preferences for redistribution in the US. In the regressions that I'm going to show you, there is the full set of controls, and then you can see all the robustness in the appendix. So we also include all variables that have been considered relevant in determining preferences for redistribution in the literature, which, is, uh, uh, which are marital and employment status, educational attainment, and then income dummies. Um, since this is a relatively short lecture, let me tell you that we con we construct an instrument, and then the instrument is um, uh, based on uh, uh, the following intuitions. Uh, first of all, there is uh, enough geographical variations, and these geographical variations come from differences in historical settlement for different ethnic groups. But there is uh, also time uh, series variations. And then the time series variations is exogenous to the counties where immigrants went and then to the countries where they come from. And there are, for the historical period that we analyzed, there are two variations. One is World War I, and then the other one is the presence of quotas. Um, so we are instrument, you know, we are playing now with the instrument. We are constructly, we are constructing a completely different instrument based on weather shock from Europe and railroad connectivity in the US. So there is a very interesting paper by Netanan and co-authors. Um, the results are very similar uh, in, in the sense that the, the two-stage least square is always very, very powerful. So with our specific instrument, the OLS and the two-stage least square is essentially almost identical, as you can see. So we'll just comment on the magnitude of the two-stage least square. So the first table indicate that there is a very strong correlation between the historical presence of immigrants and then a liberal ideology in the US. And just to give you a sense of the magnitude, um, a 5% increase in immigrants is associated with a 6% increase in democratic identifications. And then if you look at preferences for redistributions, you have equally strong result but then the magnitude is a little bit smaller, but it's still pretty large compared to other characteristics that typically drive preferences for redistribution. Uh, so let me comment on some of these other characteristics if you're not uh, familiar with the literature. So if we look at the five percentage point increase in immigrants' shares, this implies an increase in preferences for redistribution, which is of the same magnitude of moving from an income of $100,000 to $10,000 in the survey. So this effect are large, is roughly 40% uh, the effect of being black, which is one of, again, uh, the main predictor of um, preferences for a distribution. And so as I told you at the beginning, we were very surprised because we were expecting just, you know, a similar uh, negative effect in the long term. But we, you know, we had this very surprising result that the presence of immigrants instead increased preferences for redistribution. And so what we do, we start with the standard culprit, which is let's start to look at the economic mechanism. Okay. And so what's that the economic mechanism? So the first mechanism based on Meltzer and Richard will be the presence of, him, uh, of uh, the, uh, the level of income. And again, here the literature will go against us in the following sense. There is a paper published in the Review of Economic Studies by uh, Sequeira and co-authors. Uh, they look at uh, the historical presence of immigrants during the age of mass migrations on the level of income and economic growth in US counties today. And they find that European immigrations uh, essentially increase the level of income. And so the, uh, the um, model of Metzler and Richard says that when the level of income is higher, so richer people won't, do not like to redistribute much towards the poor. And so this will bias the result against us. The other uh, um, economic mechanism would be the characteristic of immigrants. You know, maybe immigrants are right with a certain level of skills, certain level of occupation, certain level of uh, literacy and so on. And so what we do, we control for all the observable characteristics. So we look at literacy, we look at skills, we look at occupations, we look at the ability of speaking English, and we also have a measure of intergenerational mobility. Uh, 
what we do, uh, so there could be also an immigrant uh, selections uh, based on, you know, the beliefs that they have, the, the level of individuals that they have from their country of origin. Again, the intuitions will go against us because what we know is that more individualistic people are more likely to migrate and then more successful immigrants are more likely to stay. So at the moment, what we do, we just control for the presence of the American frontier. So this is a paper by Batsy and co-authors. Uh, so they essentially show that the people who were going to the frontier, they were more individualistic. So, you know, if, if it's a spurious correlations proxy for this, we could control for it. And then another thing that we can do, so we haven't done it yet because it's quite demanding empirically, we can look at the first name of immigrants and then we can see if the one who arrives to the US have more unique names, which is a proxy for individualism. So we can control for individualism directly. So we are in the process of doing that. Uh, instead, what we think is the following. So we think, well, immigrants who arrived in the US, they were already exposed to the welfare states uh, they were probably more left-leaning than the rugged individualist that was present in the US uh, at the time. And as I show you from the map, in some of the counties, the share was very large. It was up to 40% of the US uh, counties' populations. So probably they were able to transmit their ideologies to people from the US. And so what we do is we construct a measure of exposure to the welfare states in uh, the country of origin. Uh, and then we see if this exposure of um, uh, welfare states in the country of origin is correlated with preferences for the distributions today. So let's maybe a bit more uh, specific. So what we do is we take um, data from Flora. And so Flora has indications on when different type of uh, welfare states reform were introduced in different countries. So most of the variations come from two types of reform, which is education reform and pension reforms. Uh, other reforms like injuries, health, and unemployment, they were more recent. So we experiment in the paper. You can construct an index using just education and pension. So this is the largest variations. You can include all the welfare reforms together, okay? And so this is the uh, index of uh, social welfare reform. Essentially, a darker number indicate that a given counties received immigrants that had a lot of exposure to the welfare states in the country of origin. And so what we do then we split the sample in two. Okay, so there were some countries that were above the median in this index of reform. So you receive a lot of immigrants which were exposed to the welfare state quite a bit in the country of origin, and the results are driven from this group. So in yellow, you have immigrants who were exposed to the welfare states uh, and uh, above the median. Uh, the other, the other uh, um, exercise that you can do, you can split by a time of arrival. So most of the re these reforms have to happen after 1900. So you can see that the effect is mostly driven by immigrants who arrived after 1900. So this is an interesting um, uh, finding because you know some people, um, you know, one comment that we received is, oh, suppose that the first immigrants arrived in countries that were already liberals, and then you know there was a spillover effect, so more liberal people were going to more liberal places. So what we do in this table, we split the historical fractions of immigrants during the age of mass migrations in two groups, one before 1850 and 1900, and the other one uh, between 1900 and 1930. And what we find is that it's only the treated group that matters. So it's only the immigrants who were exposed to welfare reform that had an effect on ideology, but the others uh, didn't matter much. And again, I have not too much time, but in the paper, there is an interesting uh, table just looking at the Germans. So one of the most important welfare reforms was the Bismarck reform. Uh, and so if we look at Germans arriving in the US before and after the Bismarck reform, we find that the result is driven by the Germans who, are, uh, who experienced this reform in the country of origin. Uh, so, uh, if, so our story is a story of, 
you know, partial is vertical transmissions because these immigrants, they have to bring with them their preferences for redistributions. But for us, it's also very important, this contact with people from the US. And so what we do, we try to construct measure of intergroup interactions. And so we look at the following. So we look at how common was intermarriage, whether immigrants were residentially integrated and when uh, they speak a language that was similar to English. So being linguistically close um, can proxy for two different channels. One is just information. So, you know, if I speak English, if I come from the UK, or if I speak a language that is similar to English, is much easier to communicate. So I can transmit my beliefs much more easily. But linguistic similarity, I work a lot on uh, cultural differences, is also a proxy for cultural difference, uh, cultural, uh, cultural uh, similarity and trust. Um, there is also a um, potential political channel. So we are exploring it more. So what we find is that the effects are stronger when immigrants are naturalized. And what we are doing now, we are looking at the supply side. So it might well be that historically immigrants uh, tend to elect politicians that were more pro uh, redistributions. And so this is why the effect could persist um, uh, over time. Uh, so let me show you the heterogeneity effect based on um, these differences in intergroup uh, contact. The first one are differences based on intermarriage. Again, both for ideology and preferences for redistributions, we tend to find in average that the results are stronger when uh, immigrants intermarry more. Uh, we also find that the results are stronger when there is more uh, residential integration. So if you remember one of the first paper that I uh, discussed at the beginning of my lecture was the result for Europe and the results were stronger when there was not much contact. And so here we find results similar in the sense that in counties where immigrants were more residential integrated, they were more able to spill over, um, to transmit their ideology to people from the US. Uh, very strong effect again for uh, linguistic. Here is a, a blue color indicate linguistic similarity. So more linguistic similarity indicates more essentially horizontal transmissions. And uh, this is not yet um, in the paper, but we did run uh, the regressions. So if you look at how much uh, immigrants were naturalized, we find that the political process is also very important. More naturalization is associated with uh, stronger preferences for redistribution. Uh, so, you know, you may wonder what this uh, measure of welfare reform proxies for. And so in our story is, so unfortunately, we do not believe of immigrants, uh, you know, during the age of mass migration. So we use this exposure to the welfare states. But we, what we do is an interesting, what I think is an interesting validation exercise, which is the following. We take the European Social Survey, and then the European Social Survey has a question on preferences for redistribution, so on whether the government should reduce income differences, so it's pretty standard. So we look at uh, the beliefs of immigrants in different European countries, and we relate these to the introductions of the welfare reform in the country of origin. Okay, so for example, if I am a German, I look at German immigrants in different European countries, and I link the preferences for the distributions of German immigrants to the year in which they see the welfare reform. Okay. And so here you will expect a negative coefficient because more recent here, it means essentially lower exposure. And so this is a validation of our measure. Okay, so essentially preferences are transmitted vertically. Uh, and then uh, the level of uh, preferences for redistributions today is linked to where a given countries introduce uh, welfare reforms. So a lot of the papers that look at, uh, so this could be in some sense a classic a persistence paper, meaning that, you know, I look at preferences for redistributions today and I link it to a specific outcome that happened in the past. Uh, and so what we try to do in the paper, again, we don't have unfortunately longitudinal data, uh, but we try to link the past to the present. Uh, so let me uh, show you uh, what I think is a very interesting chart. 
So these are two repeated cross sections regressions, uh, and then each dot uh, is a democratic vote share in the US. And we regress it. Uh, these are all two stage least square, and again, very similar to the OLS result. Uh, controlling for all the economic characteristics, this is uh, uh, the uh, voting share for the Democratic Party on uh, the fractions of immigrants. And what you find is that immigrants didn't matter uh, up to 1924, but then there was this huge spike in 1928. And so what happened in 1928? So in 1928, Al Smith, uh, which was of Irish descent and Roman ca uh, Catholic, was the candidate for the Democratic Party. And so we read this very interesting book, uh, The Formations of a Democratic Majority by Christine Anderson. And so what's essentially, uh, what she claims in the book um, is a mobilization theory. So her story is that uh, there is this uh, 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 candidate, and so uh, he was of uh, Irish origin, and he was responsible for bringing the children of you immigrations into an increasing welfare oriented democratic party. So this was a period of realignment from the, Demo the Republican party to the democratic party. And so he claims that now there was this new character and especially the second generations, they felt very close and they felt very close because the democratic party during this period started to become much more uh, welfare oriented. And so uh, again, unfortunately, we don't have vote share by people in the US and then second generation. So she has a lot of anecdotal evidence on the participation of uh, second generations um, in, in the political um, uh, history of uh, the US. The only thing that we can do is uh, the following. So we, uh, we, we, we took a paper that collected data on uh, welfare expenditures during the uh, New Deal, okay? And so uh, the authors have different programs. So relief from relief expenditure to housing loans. And then these programs are categorized based on how redistributive they are, okay? And so, and then we regress this on the immigrants share. So in black and in square bracket, you see the beta coefficient. So relief expenditure, they were very pro redistributions because they went during the period of the New Deal to counties, counties where the level of unemployment was extremely high. But for example, farm programs, they were not very redistributive or much re less redistributive in nature because they went to counties, they were based, um, they went to countries where there were a lot of farms but the amount of money was correlated to the size of the farm. And so, you know, if, this, if the farm was larger, then they were, the county was probably richer. So it was less redistributive in nature. And we find, again, this is more descriptive, but we do find that there is um, essentially a correlation between uh, the presence of immigrants and then the generosity of uh, the welfare state. Uh, so, uh, Essentially, this is uh, our conclusions from the short run to the long run. So what we find is that uh, today, if you look at US born individuals where there were a lot of immigrants from the period of mass migrations, I will speculate with current results today. We do find that people from the US, um, they, have, they tend to be more left leaning. Uh, they have a much more liberal ideology and they have stronger preferences for redistribution. And our story is a combination of vertical transmissions and horizontal transmissions. So immigrants, they bring with them uh, different ideologies and then they transmit these ideologies via different form of um, different group interactions. And then this process is uh, much more likely to be reinforced by uh, when the immigrants are much more included uh, politically. And so our conclusion is, you know, Im immigration is a huge topic, so not only in the US, but you know, in all countries, many, many countries uh, uh, today, it's critical to distinguish between the short run and the long run of economic diversities. And then it's important also 
to study which type of characteristics did immigrants uh, bring uh, with them. Uh, so how can we uh, reconcile all, uh, all the evidence, okay? So the literature, and then I think there is consensus on the literature, is when you look at the short-term effect, these people are different. And so, you know, in Europe, in the US, you find that there is usually a negative effect of immigrants on preferences for redistribution. So in the long run, we see that the result can be different and the result can be different as a result of um, horizontal transmissions, okay? Uh, and so uh, this is something that I would like to say. I, I, and again, I can just speculate and then, you know, it could be just for another paper, uh, you know, much external validity there is. So what's we, so in our context, there are several ingredients, right? So one ingredient is, uh, the ideology that immigrants bring with them. And so in our case, immigrants arrived with more left-leaning ideology compared to people in the US. Uh, the other one is the size of the immigrants. So this is a period in which the influx of immigrants was massive. And the third one is the cultural similarity. Okay, so I think probably it would be nice to write a model, but probably you need all the three ingredients. You know, you need a sufficiently strong ideology from the country of origin from which you come from. Then you need a sufficient uh, a relative size, and then you need a sufficient similarity. And so we are working on a, a bit more on trying to pin down the different mechanisms. So we work quite a bit on the ideology that immigrants bring with them. We are doing, uh, so we, we exploit quite a bit any form of intergroup contact that we can uncover given the data that we have. And what we are doing more is we are playing a bit with the size. So we, we are trying to see if there is a tipping point. So maybe the results are driven by counties in which that there is at least, I don't know, 25% of immigrants. And then we are looking also the supply side. So it might well be that, for example, more immigrants participate in the political process like Al Smith. So it might well be that a lot of <clears throat> governors in local elections that we see in the US are from immigrants origin. And it might well be that immigrants tend to vote for uh, politicians that are more left leaning. So we are trying to you know, bound the result with this uh, supply uh, side. Then with cultural similarity, again, would the result be different if immigrants brought with them a right-leaning ideology? You know, maybe. Uh, uh, you know, we would need to study a, a different way of immigration with different characteristics of immigrants. But again, if I can pin down uh, the main ingredient, uh, there are three. One is which characteristic immigrants bring with them. Uh, the size of the immigrants group and how much uh, intergroup contact uh, there is. Um, and I think with this, uh, I can conclude so that we can have time for uh, questions uh, and answer. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Paolo. This was uh, very interesting. Uh, so now the floor is open for questions. I guess everyone should be able to unmute themselves. Uh, if not, please let me know and I can help with that. Maybe I can just uh, just open the, the Q&A session with a question myself. So uh, really interesting, especially the mechanism. So I was thinking about uh, the, uh, the uh, what the immigrants, the ideologies immigrants bring with them. Um, so you mentioned the reforms in the countries uh, of origin of the immigrants. And I was wondering, of course, I'm not familiar with the, the data, so I don't know if that's feasible, but could you do some sort of uh, maybe like a regression discontinuity design if you use the cohorts of, uh, of immigrants uh, that come before, so who are not exposed to, to some, let's say, welfare reforms in Europe and uh, compare it to the, to the cohorts uh, which uh, are in contact with immigrants who come after they, uh, to, to immigrants that were exposed to the reforms in their countries of origin before arriving to the US. Uh, do you think this could be an idea to test this sort of a mechanism? Yeah, we try to do it in the papers uh, in a variety. Mm -hmm. So we do it very cleanly for um, uh, the Germans because the size is very large in in, in many uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in many counties. So I didn't have time to show it, but this is an interesting part. That there is uh, yeah, we don't have enough 
to do it for all the immigrants group. So as a rough approximation, but we can improve it, is the table that I show you when we have two periods. So the one before 1900, very little exposure, and then the one after 1900 with exposure. So we can try to improve on that dimensions, but we try to go uh, along the, the, the dimensions somehow. It's just that we don't have enough for all the countries. And then for some countries, the share of immigrants is, is very small. So we have we need to have a combined index, but we the closest that we do is uh, for the Germans. Okay, I see, thank you. Uh, I have a question, uh, Gözde, should I go ahead? Yes, Ulaş, please go ahead. Yeah, pa Paola, thank you very much. That was an excellent review. Um, well, I mean, a general comment. Uh, the story that you are telling us seems to be a very happy one in the long term, but very unhappy one in the short term. Uh, maybe I understand, I don't understand right, but that's the impression I have. And in the short term, you're really talking about the 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 the, uh, the political backlash from the natives yeah uh, and in the long term as uh, as long as they mingle with each other i mean the immigrants and the natives and they kind of you know mix with, with each other economically socially and culturally uh, it goes to a nice story like you know uh, it works and we know that it worked historically. I mean, from the late 19th century, first globalization, and uh, I mean, different episodes of the migration throughout the 20th century. And now uh, we know that it works. But um, my question is this, what would be your policy advice if you were uh, approached by a group of, you know, politicians? Um, well, I mean, based on such a review and and uh, being an, uh, being an expert on this, what would what would be your your advice uh, to have to deal with have to deal with uh, you know uh, the migration politically in the short term, not economically in the in the long term? Um, that would that's my question, and uh, an extension would be uh, how. I mean, maybe you can just uh, make some comments on the on the different kinds of redistribution. Yes. Uh, well, the natives change their preferences for the redistribution, but what kind of redistribu redistributions? And the, and the, what would be the redistributive policy response to the changing preferences of the natives? What do you think of that? Thank you very much. Uh, these are excellent questions. So let me comment first on the first one. Uh, I will first comment with the literature and then, you know, some potential uh, solutions, if, if any. So if you look at the, uh, so there are some positive effects in the short term in the following way. So for example, the paper, I, I went quickly um, on one of the paper, but the paper by um, Maida and co-authors find that they don't do preferences for the distribution, they could have done it, but they look at ideology and they find that uh, moving ideology right or left depends on the level of skills of the immigrants. And so again, the, maybe there may be uh, heterogeneity. And so, uh, you know, if you invest in educations of the immigrants, this can uh, shape the result. The other effect, um, the other positive effect for the short term is the paper by, uh, Stanceva, uh, Alesina and Miano. So what they find is they find to manipulate the perceptions. And so they have an information treatment. And so what they find is that it, 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 people have much more negative stereotype than reality. And they find that if they correct the stereotype, this correct, not completely, but this correct partially, the, the preferences for redistributions. And so I think if we invest in the level of skills of the immigrants, level of education, integrate schools, and then change the stereotype, then this process of changing preferences for redistributions could be much faster uh, in, in the long term. So th this could be like a, a potential uh, viable uh, solutions. Now, the questions on preferences for a which type of preferences for a distribution. So if uh, I went quickly, so unfortunately here we are limited by the existing data. And so again, we, we could conduct a more precise surveys. So in, 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 in the questions that we, so one standard questions is, should the, should the government reduce income differences? Um, and then the other questions are, 
support for specific policies. So for example, uh, reduce the deficit with taxes, increase the minimum wage and so on. Um, so what's the literature in, on preferences for redistribution says is that if you have higher preferences for redistributions, you vote for a higher level of taxes. And then once you have a higher level of taxes, this has a feedback effect. So this will be the paper by, by Piketty. So to the extent that you believe that higher tax sections and redistribution is good for the economy, if we can manipulate uh, you know, the beliefs uh, about redistribution, this should have a, a long-term effect on, 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 on politics. But again, this is a very reduced form because we don't have uh, the, you know, all, all the papers that have been written on these topics, somehow they have different pieces and then they put the different pieces together based on the uh, theoretical uh, evidence. Uh, Hassan, you can go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, I cannot stop uh, start my video, but uh, let me ask you. Uh, you partially, uh, thank you for the talk, uh, Paula. You already answered my question. Actually, I was going to ask about the different kinds of redistribution, okay. especially education. But let yeah. me rephrase my question. In your, uh, when you construct the uh, exposure to welfare, you already included education, one of the reforms. Yes. And, um, and in the European welfare state literature, as non-economists, I'm thinking, they don't really include education part of the welfare, but the develop, develop, uh, development economics, uh, and especially in the open economics, when people talk about welfare state, they actually mean uh, include, excuse me, uh, education. And uh, 19th century Europe in your uh, reforms, I agree because it's like a developing country, European countries back then, kind of. Uh, so um, uh, my question comment is the, the kind of redistribution, as you said, your question in the existing surveys is limited by basically questions relating to social assistance, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And, and taxation, so not really education is uh, covered. Yeah. So it was, uh, my question will be probably. Is, is your is your concern that um, I, my concern it, is that if there is lots of cultural difference, actually the uh, redistribution through education system, the same voters might prefer uh, integration. So redistribution through education system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I see your point. Ideally, I mean, my ideal my ideal days is it would be to have sub questions to pin down better the mechanism, some questions for specific reforms. And then, you know, if, if, if a state introduce, if a country introduce a health reform, I should see more support for Obama, for example, or something like that. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, we don't know. I mean, what we can do, um, we can test the robustness to the inclusion of exclusions of education. So I thought that your concern was that introductions of compulsory educations can be mostly a proxy for human capital so maybe it's not necessarily redistributions i think no, I, I think it is i do believe it's redistribution you think yeah. it's you, you think yeah, it's yeah, 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 okay yeah, okay yeah. I, I, okay so this was not your concern so uh -huh. no we we don't we don't have enough granular data what's what we see one thing that we can do that we haven't done is i show you a table in which we try to validate our index by looking at preferences for redistributions um, among European immigrants and the year of the introductions of the reforms. And so we have the different type of reforms all together as an index. We can do this exercise by one reform, one reform, each reform one by one. And so in this case, I can see if preferences for redistributions were mostly shaped by the education reform, the pension reform, or any of the others. So I, I can sort of see which one. I mean, we in the paper, we find much stronger results when we 
initially actually education reform was the only one that we introduced, but just because it was introduced much early on compared to all the others. And so I don't know if it's exposure specific or uh, topic specific, yeah. But yeah, if I had the, yeah, the data it would be interesting, uh, yeah, to see, you know, through schooling versus other type of redistribution. Uh, thank you. Um, another dimension of heterogeneity, or perhaps another uh, channel that I thought would be interesting, is maybe the the reason for for immigration. Uh, do you think this would be important? Because well, skills was one of the channels that you you mentioned. Uh, so basically, what led me to to this question was I was thinking of the the wave of the Jewish scientists uh, migrating to the U.S. in the the 1930s. So. Um, there, uh, so, but before in the, the period that you're, uh, you have in your uh, analysis, that's mostly for economic opportunities, uh, if, I, if I know well, uh, right? So uh, could you use, for example, this other period, would you have enough observations? Because I know that was still a, a, a huge wave of migration, although not as large as the previous ones, uh, to, to sort of tests whether, test whether different, uh, migrants that were that had different skill levels or different reasons for uh, for migration had differential effects. Yeah, we were interested in this specific period because there is a large literature. I don't know how much we can slide. The data is hard. Um, it, it's hard to attribute the reasons, uh, and so it's hard to construct an index with the reasons from from immigration. So in that sense, our part it's a uh, um yeah it's it's very uh reduced re reduced form um yeah i think uh, on the mechanism so uh, uh, now the paper it's mostly like 90 percent on the mechanism but like compared to the literature on preferences for the distribution the stunning result was really the first one and then but it's important to understand uh it, yeah what's what's behind it yeah we can do more. I mean, we, we didn't look at the most recent period just because there is the paper by Maida and co-authors. So, so they look at immigrants after the 1970s and then these compositions is completely different. And for their period, they find that what's really matters for ideology is the level of skills. So what you're saying is that it might be that there are other characteristics in your period that shapes the movement to ideology, yes, but we didn't find a clever way. So yeah, mm -hmm. we, we can try to isolate, for example, the Jewish, so for, you know, the one that they, they had mm -hmm. to escape to the US. I don't know if we have enough variations, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Um, are there actually, uh, so, sorry, I'm not very familiar with this, this literature. Uh, I was wondering whether there are any uh, papers that measure the preferences for redistribution, perhaps with some uh, experimental uh, outcomes, like measuring inequality aversion or, or things like that. The, the paper by, yes, there are some papers. So the, the, the paper by Sancheva and co-authors mm -hmm. has one experimental part of validations and there is there, there is a paper by Chris Roth in which, yeah, they, they yeah, it, it could be done, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's hard in our case to find the treatment because I would need to randomly allocate migrants. And so I don't know, mm -hmm. I would, yeah, I, I could just do a, a perceptions treatment maybe, you know, suppose that we are playing a game and then we are asked to redistribute and then we receive an information that among mm -hmm. our, yeah, groups, uh, there are people from different countries. Yeah, there, there was an interesting paper, it's not related to immigration, but it's related to cultural distance that was conducted at the European Institute actually with students and so they were using mostly trust games. So it's not necessarily to redistribution, but partially, right? Because it's a, and they did find that people tend to redistribute when they were matched with students from the same country of origin. Mm -hmm. And so, and so this is the homophilia effect, which would be consistent with this literature. But one interesting part is that the stereotype matters. So for example, mm -hmm. students from Northern Europe, they were much more generous. 
and then Italians they 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 tend to share much less, and then they when they were paired with Italians they reflected the stereotype. So you know, if I am an Italian and I'm paired with a person from Northern mm-hmm. Europe. I'm not very generous to start with, but I give a bit more because I know that the North European are trustworthy. But if I'm paired with another Italians, I know that the stereotype among the Italians is that they're not too trustworthy. So there is evidence, uh, maybe not necessarily on the topic, but yeah, mm-hmm. they have been validated. The measure mm-hmm. have been validated, yeah. Uh- Hassan, are you raising your hand again? Or? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, I just a quick question on the European literature that because yeah. I don't know. Is there in this uh, survey another question about the uh, people's preferences about the type of immigrations, like uh, limited period uh, immigra- immigration? How do they uh, yes. perceive it? Uh, is it? Uh, yeah, there, there is. Uh, so in, in the paper by Alessina and co authors on Europe, uh-huh. there are a variety of questions on immigrations and how immigrants are uh-huh. perceived and whether uh-huh. immigrants should be accepted or not. And what they find is that the more ba- more negative views you have among immigrants, the less likely you are to redistribute. Yeah, so these correlations have been, yeah. No, no, not the redistribution, like the kind of immigration, for example, uh, like time limited immigration, like the, or just like the Dubai style immigration, where you will never be a citizen. Like uh, uh, yeah, I, I think they, they use a combi- so, uh, um, uh, so what's, I didn't explain, uh, I, I didn't explain uh, well what uh, I wanted to say. So I, I think they try to combine the two. So they have a, a bunch of questions on, which type of Im- what's what's your view about immigrants? I don't know if it's so details about the type of immigrations mm-hmm. that people would like to see. Mm-hmm. And then they see they try to see if wanted a certain type of immigration. I see your point, but maybe you are saying that it's not that necessarily I don't like them. It depends how they enter the countries that matters. Is that correct? Uh, or how long they will stay. Or how long they will stay, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Especially yeah. if they are not going to retire here, work yes. and pay taxes and then go back. Yeah, they try to tackle it by looking at the size of the welfare state of the of, of the countries. It's called, it's called welfare magnet effect, mm-hmm. meaning that people, if I think that you're going to stay forever, then yeah, uh, maybe I'm not going to like to redistribute as much. I don't think if it's so detailed, but they were trying to essentially get at the mechanism that you have in mind. For Europe, okay. yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. um, do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, uh, I guess if there are no more questions, uh, we will just close the session. Uh, Paula, thank you so much uh, for, for joining us and so early in the morning for you. <laughs> no, I'm fine. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for thank staying you. so late. Thank it, you very it was much. a pleasure. And uh, next time, uh, hopefully, we can uh, have you in person. Uh, yes. Yeah. Hopefully soon. Thank okay. you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Paula. Thank you so much again. Yeah. Good luck with the semester. <laughs> Thank you. I hope to see you in person again soon. Ciao. Yeah, yeah, that would be great. Ciao. Ciao.